Hey, welcome to another episode of Behind the Bar podcast brought to you by the coaches and clients of RT Fitness Durham, Sunderland, and of course, the Barbell Club, where we take you from complete beginner to photo shoot ready. If you need any information at all on our programs, there's a link in the description below. Click that. Make sure you uh, follow the YouTube channel or if you listen to on any of the podcast platforms, please click follow, share the show. Yeah, just keep spreading it so we can keep doing this. So today's episode, we have Nikki Chisty, who is a online transformation coach. He's got some brilliant results out there, so please check them out. His link will also be in the description below as well. Today, we talk about how he has gone from doing so he's bodybuilding from a very young age as well, did his first show at 16. And then when he made the decision to start using PEDs, um, going from that part of his journey there where he added an insane amount of weight, I think it was 50 kilos-ish off the top of my head in a matter of a couple of years. And then a few things happened um, and that obviously changed the way he was thinking and to put his health first. So really good insight on this. Um, I'm quite clueless to PED, so from my perspective, it's always great to have a good understanding of all this. Super top block as well, and it's worth watching all the way through to the end on this one. So like I said before, click the subscribe button, share it. Enjoy. Right, welcome, buddy. So who is Nitty Chisty? Right, I'm glad you asked Jenny this one last <laughs> week because it allows you to prepare. Um, I want to say somebody that's hardworking, you know, passionate, considerate, rather than saying what I do. So all of those things, plus I've been a competitive bodybuilder for about, since 2014, so about nine years now. Um, competed 11 times, coach, but yeah, all of those things first and foremost. Right, meant. So um, yeah, so you're an online coach, yeah. so who do you help? Anybody, anybody, competitive clients, people who just want to get ready for a holiday, people who just want to get in shape for the first time, best shape of their life, anybody that just wants to make an improvement in their life, you know, hopefully that physical change carries over into other aspects of their life, but literally anybody. It doesn't have to be a certain type of client or a certain, you know, training age, anybody that's just getting into training, has been training for a few years, or somebody that's very experienced, anybody that fits that category, you know, yeah. nobody in particular. Right, well, this is probably from me. Why, why online? Because obviously you have done okay. like, yeah. uh, so, You've, you've done before, yeah, haven't you, like in yeah. person, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I did, uh, in person, I started that in about 2016, so going on eight years. And initially, um, just personal training, but that eventually became a bit of online as people who were local but not close enough to come for personal training, started doing a bit of online with them. And um, then as of like the lockdowns 2020, I just went strictly online and I've stuck with that ever since. Now, I do really enjoy the in-person, but I also like the parts of what comes with being an online coach, being able to train yourself at the right time yeah. when it's appropriate to when you want to train. Um, but I do miss the in-person. I would hopefully get back to that at some point. But online's been really helpful in me and my own fitness journey. Right. What do you prefer? <sighs> it's difficult <laughs> because one has that in-person interaction where you can be really hands-on and you can really show somebody how to train hard, how to execute the exercise, which through the phone, like with voice notes and video demonstrations mm -hmm. and explanations, that's good. And it does allow somebody to learn. But I think when you're in person, you can really just get somebody up to speed really, really quickly. But then at the same time, if you only see that person a couple of times a week, three times a week, you don't get the same interaction. Whereas with online coaching, I get to speak to that person every single day. And a lot of my clients can vouch for that, that I will try and keep on top of them yeah. every day because I think it's really important that for them, I'm showing how invested I am in their journey so that they can, again, feel invested in the process themselves because they know that we've both shared that common interest in their goal yeah. um, and them achieving that goal. Whereas with personal training, you maybe only see that person a couple of times a week, so it's not the same. So I think there's pros and cons. I like the fact that with online, I get to see that person every day, in a sense, like talk to them every yeah. day. Whereas personal training, I get to help them get to grips with the training much quicker. Whereas online, it might be a bit of, you know, teething problems initially, getting used to a training plan or an exercise. So also in person, you can kind of build that rapport a little bit quicker in that right. you see the person, they know who you are rather than it being a text message. So there's pros and cons of both, but I think they both have advantages. I think the best scenario for me would be to either be personal training and to interact with that person on the phone outside of the sessions yeah. or online and see that person maybe once a month for a bit of a refreshing kind of session. So <laughs> they both have great, yeah. great things. It's just, you can't do everything. 
No. Um, in that capacity, especially if somebody's far away. So also online straight in that allows me to coach people who are further away. So yeah. that's been really useful because otherwise I wouldn't have had those as clients full stop. So that's been good. It's, a, it's, it's one of them things like, I think what well, I think one to one in house as well is very time consuming. Yes. Um, and then for say you've worked with someone just even for a month, train them three, maybe four times a yeah. week. And then for them to say, oh, I'm not doing it next month. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like you're so invested and yeah, you, you put that time and effort in when you could have helped five, six people in yeah. the same amount of time yes. yeah. online. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Very true. Sometimes it's like you say, sometimes you feel almost more invested in the process than their goals than they are. Yeah. But yeah but we generally yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. But it's just making sure that if you do continually show them that invest, how invested you are, then they will be invested in it as well. Making sure that you're not showing that you're disinterested. You want to make sure that they know how much you want them to succeed. So, yeah, I feel like you can do that through both, but um, in person you can show it even more so because you're like in the session with them, total yeah. tunnel vision. Yeah. <laughs> it's it, yeah. I mean, we haven't ventured in the online world yet, um, but I'd, I'd just like to get an insight of it for people who yes. do it as full yeah. time as yeah. well. So brilliant. So bodybuilding. When did it start? So and why? Yeah, <laughs> um, I've always been fascinated with it. I always just wanted to be leading. How, my how old are you first? Oh, twenty five. Coming twenty six. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I started when I was fourteen, and I've just always been fascinated with being like muscular and athletic, and I've always done sports, but I always like like the fact that with bodybuilding or other sports like similar to that like weightlifting boxing the individual sports where you're not really reliant on somebody else you know your own success solo, is yeah. up to you not that um, i don't like team sports because i played football but i just like the idea that you're not reliant on anybody else and it's up to you to succeed you know obviously still with bodybuilding you have people around you you know you have a supportive family partner spotter um, yeah spotter. <laughs> exactly exactly you have people that make up how you're getting on and people who you know, even just nice words of like encouragement keeps you going. But um, I find that with like, it's up to you to eat those meals, to turn up to the gym, yeah. to get that cardio done, to not uh, set the alarm for a little bit later, you know, you know, um, lying and stuff like that. So I liked the fact that it was up to me and me only to, you know, actually go to the gym every day, train, you know, consistently eat that way. Uh, whereas, you know, with a sport like football, for instance, you're just, if somebody else is not pulling the weight, then you're, outcome can be yeah. negatively impacted. I like that with bodybuilding, it's up to you. And just always admired like people like Arnold Schwarzenegger and having that physique in the films and just kind of wanted that myself. Um, didn't want to be out of shape, you know? Yeah. As simple as that, really. <laughs> that started at like 14, just training, you know, the typical bit of biceps, bit of chest, yeah. bit of press ups. And then that eventually like, by the age of 15, I was training on a proper bodybuilding split. Um, got a good 18 months of training. Then I did my first competition at 16. Wow. Yeah. So, 16. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's absolutely mental. So how, how did you get into that? Like how, like did the gym where you were in, like put you forward for Not that? Or, or how, um, how did, event, how no, did you get them? Yeah, that, initially yeah. just like my dad had some dumbbells and a barbell. So I just used them Right. and um, seen good kind of changes. I wouldn't say I've got like incredible genetics, but enough to see a good response and yeah. know that actually uh, there might be some potential here. And um, I just, I don't know, I've always been the type of person that when I get into something, I become heavily invested in it, whether right. that be a different sport or my job or anything like that. I just, I, I'm not very good at like doing something as a bit of a hobby or something that I can take it or leave it. I get really into it. So a bit of press ups turned into full blown bodybuilding. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so just a bit extreme in that sense, but um, don't have any regrets, you know, just it's been a massive like impact on my life. Like probably the people that I'm friends with, the work that yeah. I do. So yeah, just, it's funny that something so simple like wanting to lift some dumbbells in the bedroom has turned out to be a career. But, yeah. but did the gym, because my son goes to the gym, yeah. uh, he's 14, and they don't let him pick up the dumbbells or anything yeah. like that. There was restrictions at the gym I was saying. It was a council run gym and you were allowed on the free weights, like the chest press, leg extension, but you yeah, weren't allowed to do any same, dumbbells, yeah. any Smith machine, any free weight pressing um, for health and safety. But is that you could argue that actually being in a fixed plane of movement could be more negatively impact the, jo like impact the joints yeah, of course, on a free yeah. weight. You just need to learn how to use the free weights, but there wasn't somebody there to show you. Just like, if you're under 16, that's all you can use. But um, I made do with what I could, and then I did the rest at home. So you'd made do with what you could and then still entered that show? No, as, no, as well? I, I okay. would say, um, 
I was able to train at like a local like rugby gym and I was able to use like a leg press and a cables there and a Smith right. machine. Uh, but I'd say from the, from the age of like 14 through till about 16, I was training just at home doing like flicking a barbell onto my, my shoulders and doing pull-ups at home and bent over rows at home, like literally everything, like full barbell, dumbbell only workouts. And then I'd say I got maybe about six or seven months training for the competition in a gym, but right. I, it wasn't like a well-equipped gym, like nowhere near this even, just like barbell, uh, bench, deadlift, uh, yeah, just squat, bench, deadlift, ultimately with wow, a, yeah. maybe a bit of machines, yeah. like a leg press, but nothing extreme. Um, so yeah, bit of a disadvantage that compared <laughs> to the people who stood next to. Yeah, were maybe about ten years older, and uh, well, maybe five, five to eight years older, um, with a fully equipped gym. But you just, I wanted to get stuck in from a young age. You know? Right. Did you wait? Did you what place? Did you come? Uh, on oh that no, one? I, I didn't place at that one. Okay, I was, right. I, I actually looked really good for a sixteen-year-old, considering I had to drop like eighteen kilograms in eighteen weeks because I just like bulked up on junk food, you know, like wow. most teenagers okay, go yeah. to bodybuilding. But I actually got in good, decent shape. Unfortunately, right before the competition, I got some terrible advice not to drink any water for 24 hours. And it was right. a disaster. I couldn't get any blood in my muscles backstage. I looked awful. But then the next year, I had some really good success at 17. So I was glad I did the first show. You know, obviously, you'd, you'd love to win your first show, but I think most people yeah, don't. Yeah. No, yeah. Um, but it was a good like learning curve because then the following year, it was really well like mapped out prep. And I didn't have anybody helping me for that, but I just, all the mistakes had, you know, had logged and written down what I'd done. Um, the next year I was able to take that forwards and train better in a proper gym and a better start point and therefore better execution of the prep itself. Not chasing my tail, trying to lose weight and yeah. things like that and not taking anybody else's advice last minute. Because when you're that young, you just, you look at somebody who looks to have been there and done it, you're gonna take that piece of advice but that can be detrimental to the 18 weeks of work you've just put in, something very last minute. So you're better to just, if you've done it yourself, you're better to just stick to what you know and not let outside kind of comments influence your decision last minute. But that's just one of those things. When you're 16, you're very impressionable and you just yeah. you do what you think is gonna be the magic finishing touch. Did, so did you have a coach then? No, no, no coach. I've never been coached for any competitions. So I did 11 right. competitions from the age of 16 to 21. I've never been coached for any of them. I just, once you've, I think once you've done quite a few yourself, it's hard to then, not that I don't think there's anybody out there that could help me because they absolutely could. Yeah. There's always like uh, somebody that can give you valuable, you know, ideas and just something that you've, especially towards the end of a prep, your decision making starts to get skewed a little bit as your energy levels are low and you start thinking you're not ready when you actually are closer than to the competition condition than you realise. But I think when you've done it that many times yourself, when you've done about four or five shows on your own, it's hard to then give away that power to somebody else because you kind of have already learned your body to a degree and you want to at least be able to take responsibility if something goes wrong. You don't want to blame anyone else. So the, the age what that's at for, for, for not having a coach, yeah. And that age in time is sort of when YouTube was on the oh, up. Yeah, so is a lot of, of your knowledge from, say, YouTube and... Yeah, to handle, yeah. like, I, I've got, if I go back home to mum and dad's, I've probably got well over 100 of the Flex magazines and Muscle right, okay. magazines. So a lot of them, just reading them from front to back yeah. multiple times. Because actually, although there was some YouTube coming out, it wasn't quite as prevalent as it is now. And you especially didn't have things like reels on your... You know, you didn't, Instagram came, I think, 2014. I think that's when that came about, 2013, yes, yeah, 14. Yeah. So... Um, I got into it and like first started watching bodybuilding, watching like the professional shows, getting the magazines in around 2011. So at that point, there wasn't anything that you could really get online apart from the odd professional bodybuilder on YouTube and then strictly the magazines. So really, I think from at that point, my first prep, my second prep, you know, getting into it um, and just learning through it myself, like reading the magazines, taking right, things yeah, from yeah. that, and then trying to, you know, experiment, experiment on myself and find out what exercises felt best. There wasn't necessarily much information on the internet at that point. I think that's, there's pros and cons to that in a sense because there's things of like mistakes I will have made that I otherwise wouldn't have, but at the same time, I'm glad I wasn't overwhelmed with the amount of information. Whereas now if somebody's getting into bodybuilding, there's this guy saying this, train in this manner, low volume, high volume, don't yeah. do these exercises, you know, don't do cardio, do loads of cardio. So. It's kind of, I'm, I'm glad that I had the ability to learn off my own back and wasn't like reliant on somebody else giving me that information because I can make the mistakes and now I can relay that to my clients. But um, yeah, nowadays obviously there's a lot more tools out there. There wasn't much out there that, back then. So it changed a yeah. lot in 10 years. Oh, oh 10 big years. time, yeah. yeah. Um, that's, 
that's a lot of mistakes yeah. over the years yeah. as well, yes. isn't it? Yeah. But it, yeah. like I said, it's, it's like shapes you said, it, you it shapes yeah. it up. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Brilliant. Um, so what, like you've done all them shows and then you wanted to move up big. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah exactly, exactly. So I did the 11 shows, like Drug Free, um, from the age, like I say, 16. I did, um, I competed a lot around 17. I did one big season of like 20, 30 week prep uh, where oh. I did the first show and then there was qualifiers and then the finals. So that was a long time. So I kind of, after doing that a lot from my late teens, I wanted to have a period of where I just grew. So from the age of like, I, I won my last show at 21. Um, and then after that, shortly after, I started my first anabolic cycle. So I've done all those years. So you'd say seven years of drug-free bodybuilding um, to then, I wanted to, that to coincide with that big growing phase where I wouldn't be entering a deficit. I'd give myself the best possible chance to grow, coincided with using anabolic. So in that period from 21 to 24, um, I want to say, yeah, like mid 2019 to late 2021 i put on 50 kilograms of body weight so like yeah so like seven or eight stone something like that yeah, yeah. yeah. Set, i think it was 73 kilograms i went up to 121 122 right yeah so just shy of 50. and i'm, I'm this is like i mean i'm not that tall yeah. but you're just five a, nine five you're five nine, nine. Yeah, 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 yeah yeah that's big yeah, yeah. It's a lot of weight. I've seen yeah. some of the pictures. Yeah, yeah, it was extreme. <laughs> you look like a different person. Yeah, I know. I've, I've lost about 10 years, like, in terms of I look 10 years younger now because I've lost that weight that I had. You do? Have, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm back down now from, so I set, like I say, I went from 73 to 122, and now I'm down at 85. So, yeah, I've kind of gone up and then back down again. Wow. Yeah. What was your food like? Oh, astronomical, like just force feeding around the clock. Just like you'd be stuffed before the first bite of your meal because the last one that you'd just eaten two hours ago was still sitting so heavy. It's just relentless. Um, upwards of like, like over a thousand grams of carbs a day, protein over 300, fats, I don't even know. Like beyond, <laughs> beyond uh, like probably like 150, 200, something sure, like that. Did Jenny say he was having like two five guys or something? Yeah, well, I was doing that. I was like, <laughs> so towards the end of it, so let's say I hit my like, uh, peak calories of like what I could get in from like clean food like the rice was maxed out the oats was yeah. maxed out like everything fruit you know the meat portions everything was just beyond what you could add you couldn't really add any more to that so once a week I would do like let's say for instance I'd train legs or my back you know body parts which yeah. I want to bring up more so than anything and then the most like caloric demanding sessions I would then like have my post-workout meal and a couple of hours later I would go for a five guys like two burgers large fries or like massive uh, sushi something like that just to get like that influx of calories once a week as opposed to eating more across the seven days because they were right, already, yeah. and days were already very difficult so we're just chucking a big spike of calories once a week just to kind of take the weekly calories up so to speak yeah jesus yeah, christ man. it's extreme <laughs> i mean for, like for me like i've i've, I've never even considered like yes. uh, using PADs. Yeah. what what's the what is that mindset switch of like, let's go? Like, yeah, so knowing like, obviously 14 years old, that's not something you should ever be considering anyway. But no. when you're getting into bodybuilding, you're conscious that that's something that you may have to consider as you get older, as you get further into the sport. Because like I had some success as an under 18, as an under 21 competitor, but you know that those days are limited if you're competing, especially in untested shows. And if that's where your goals lie, then yeah. you understand that you have to make it a level playing field. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with natural bodybuilding and in hindsight, and maybe I would have stuck with that um, because there's, you know, still you can travel the world with that as well. Yeah. It's not to say that only assisted bodybuilding allows you to see the world because that's not true. But when you're reading those magazines and you're watching those videos and those guys are within the federations where the bodybuilders are assisted, that's who you maybe aspire to become like. So you think, well, that's the federation I want to compete with. Yeah. And you know that if you compete with that federation, you can't do a drug free. Um, so it was something I weighed up from like competing obviously the first time at 16, that was still like not even on my radar, knowing like it was on my radar, but it wasn't a consideration. I knew that I would wait until I was around 21 or you know, into my early to mid twenties. But I came to that kind of crossroads where you know, you're either gonna have to now stick with natural bodybuilding or you go and kind of pursue what you've wanted to do, but you've yeah. not done yet because you know you're too young and you wanted to, I wanted to, you know, get what I could from drug free bodybuilding essentially like everything I come from a diet make sure that my training my diet my lifestyle my like adherence is year round to ensure that it's actually justified because I don't think it's worthwhile you know embarking like on using anabolics if you you're drinking you're smoking you're not yeah. adhering to the lifestyle or you're bodybuilding you know intensely for the competition for like 12 weeks of the year and then you're spending the rest of the year 
you know, not really training consistently yes, or eating yeah, well. I wanted yeah. to make sure that I was at least in a position mentally where I am eating those five or six meals every single day. I am training four or five days a week consistently and I'm doing that year round. I wouldn't want to put anything in my body that could potentially compromise my health without making sure that I'm doing everything I need to prior to that. So I feel that like when you're in your late teens, you're not really in a position to do that because you might even change your goals. You might, you know, yeah. whereas you're, and even then you're not fully developed even at 21. Your brain continues to develop until you're in your late twenties. So. Um, you could argue that even then you're not ready, but I think that when you've already competed 11 times and you know that you're at that yes, position yeah. now where I kind of, the last show I did, I wanted to make sure that I won that naturally to kind of almost give myself that confirmation that, oh, okay, right, it is worth pursuing this now. Um, and if I hadn't, I maybe wouldn't have. So it was just kind of like a stepping stone that I did right. throughout my teens and my like early 20s um, to make sure that it was actually justified and is actually worthwhile pursuing that. I didn't want to just jump in the deep end and especially not at a young age. So. It was kind of yeah coming to a crossroads and thinking that this is what the the goal has always been is to compete in this federation for them for instance like the ifpb and i know that to do that i would have to be assisted yeah yeah so it was kind of like the decisions kind of made for you but it wasn't like and the decision i took lightly it was like weighed over like you know seven years of training knowing that i couldn't do it at that young age but i knew i was coming to that point where you kind of have to make the decision especially if you want to have some success through your 20s yeah so that's kind of like the reason i started then um, and then made sure that over those two or three years where I was kind of building up that um, I was just not deviating from the lifestyle, so to speak. Yeah, just so you've, it sounds like you've maximizing just... Maximising it. ...thought you've, you've just went full athlete. Yeah, yes, yeah, exactly. Like if you were exactly. going to do that, I, yeah. you have to do it on a full yeah. athletic, not Dave down the pub, exactly. like just starting the gym. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it's almost like ensuring that you can do it and stick to it for long enough to make sure that when you're going to do that and potentially compromise your health, that you're actually there's going to be some reward because you're not doing it inconsistently. Yeah. And if I look back to when I was like 17, 18 and I was competing, I would be very, very consistent on the prep. Like I would never deviate. However, the other months of the year I would probably have that food that I otherwise wouldn't. I'd, I'd be, I'd, I'd go for a night out or something like that. You yeah. know? Um, just normal kind of late teens, early 20s stuff. Um, so I knew at that point after the last competition I was ready to just go all in and not, um, like I didn't have a drink for like four years. Right. So, so it's just like that, kind of like, just like a monk almost. Yeah. Do you drink now? Oh, occasionally. I haven't yeah. had any since Christmas, so. Yeah, so it's just if and when. In June, yeah, yeah, exactly. If and when, sweet. So it's, do you know what it is? It's such a taboo subject, but within the bodybuilding realm, it, it, it's just the norm. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it is the norm. Yeah. That's, yeah. That it yeah. Would, I, I don't think the everyday person understands actually how normal it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know, well, it's, it's one of those things that people don't discuss because there is that stigma surrounding yeah. it. Um, and I even remember when I was natural, like 17, 18, there'd be people around me, people that I even used to train with that would, you know, accuse me of using them, you know, and yeah. you, almost, you can understand why people don't speak openly about it because there is that stigma. Um, because people don't know the ins and outs of like, it can be done in a safer manner. Um, some people don't allow it to impact their emotions and things like that, yeah. whereas others do, obviously, so they give it a bad reputation. But um, I can understand why people shy away from talking about it, but I've always been very transparent. And even to those people who would say, you're using it when I wasn't, um, I would say, well, the day that I do, I will tell people because yeah. I don't see any need to lie about something. You know, it's my body, it's my choice. And um, I think it's important that if you are using it, you're transparent because otherwise people have the false, like, false reality thinking yeah. that oh, he's natural when actually you're not. Um, but equally, I'm glad that I was able to demonstrate that you can achieve things in the sport naturally as well. Uh, prior, yeah, of prior, course. Prior, prior to that, but um, because people will often will think that if he's in good shape, he must be assisted when that's not necessarily the case. If your diet's you know, on point and your training's immaculate, then you're gonna see progress that others won't, even when they're assisted. You know, and I see a lot of people that are using anabolics that don't have a great physique, but I see people that aren't using any that have a great physique. So it's what you do with it. Um, but I can understand why people don't often talk about it because often people, especially in the general public, will kind of discredit that physique because he's taken this. That's the only reason yeah. he looks like that when there's so many factors to building a physique. And that's just one part of the jigsaw. Do you think, like, I, I think it should be talked about more, yeah. probably because of the, the younger generation, so 19 below, yeah. We'll just take anything yes, what, what Jimmy says in the yeah, gym. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. And so it's like, I think the education should be put in there because of how widely, because yeah. yeah, like definitely. you could, 
I mean, I don't know anybody myself, but I bet you I can make a couple of calls and yes. get some yeah. within yeah. the next few hours. Yes, oh, definitely, definitely. The only difficulty is that you want that information to be out there so that people can do it safely, but you want to make sure that the people putting that information out there aren't reckless themselves. Because yeah. often you'll find where it's people who are using it are heavily, heavily reliant on it, and they'll say, this dose is the right dose to use, and this compound is the right dose to use for them, and maybe they're abusing it to an extent, and you don't want some young person to watch that video instead of the other individual who's telling you use less use it safely yeah. do it taper it up very slowly try and get the most from as little as possible so it's making sure that yes that information should be out there so that people can do it safely but you want to make sure that they don't learn from the wrong people yeah because there will be people that will put out the youtube videos and tell you i take this and i take this and i take this almost bragging about the doses that they use and you don't right. want somebody okay. young and impressionable and natural to think well that's what i need to take because i want to look like that when they could benefit from maybe a few more natural years first but then if they do like decide to go down that route to at least do it in the safest manner possible the least amount possible so right. it's tricky it's, yeah. it's like it's hard to regulate it because you'll get some people who give out really good information for people that do want to you know chase that goal pursue that dream without compromising on the health but then you have some people who maybe take advantage of that maybe ah, selling it, is it. Dicey. yeah isn't it? Yeah. it is it's hard it is dicey it's a, yeah fucking hell I didn't think it's it like that. Yeah. Is is there anybody actually out there who does it? Who there is. There's, there's one. There's one guy, um, John Jewett. I think uh, a lot right. of people who are in the bodybuilding community will know who he is. He has even like they call. I think it's called Jay Free University, where people will go and learn from him on like training and nutrition as well, but also the chemical yes, side. Yeah. Um, and he seems to be one that's really into like safe models like using right. the, the least amount possible, avoiding certain compounds that aren't approved for human use and things like that. Right. Yeah, because there is a lot of veterinary stuff out there. Yeah, so it's I, making sure that people get the right information and don't use what the body's not really meant to be exposed to. Yeah. Because a lot, a lot, to be fair, a lot of the things that are used in the body bone community are actually drugs that have uses in medicine, you know, for burns victims and stuff like that. So they're actually, in certain dosages, they can be used safely. Obviously, anything above... Uh, super sorry super uh, anything you use super physiologically you know beyond our natural levels is deemed abuse but right you've got to there's a kind of you've got a kind of way out or oh, this is maybe a bit of abuse but it's also uh, i want this goal so it's making sure that people are understanding of that yeah that there is always going to be some sort of detrimental effect from taking these things but it's making sure that you're doing them in the safest manner possible and getting the right information before you do that i wouldn't like to be in a position where I was using it without really, really thoroughly researching prior to using it. Right. I was glad, I'm glad that, because I was obviously holding off for so many years that I'd watched videos and been able to wait, like, identify who was the right person to listen to. And when I did my first, like, anabolic cycle, it was under supervision with somebody, so. All right, well, yeah, so good, I coach. right. I don't know, but I did. Brilliant, that's, that's my mind yeah. blown, by the way. <laughs> so, um, heart condition and yes. obviously injury yes yeah yeah so at the end of that um three year period well i want to say probably most like two and a half year period of me growing going from natural to assisted now i've had something like like i say i'm 25 now uh, this seemed to come back when i was around 24 yeah yeah 24 um so when i was about 17 18 i started developing like palpitations noticing what i now know to be atrial fibrillation where your heart rhythm goes in and out it goes it can spike your heart frozen extra beats it's almost like um if you consider your heart and the signals in your body like a wi-fi signal and sometimes that connection is not as strong and you sometimes skip a beat or you get an extra beat where it shouldn't be um, and that can be quite overwhelming when you're feeling that and you can, you're conscious of that. Um, so that was something that happened a lot when I was like 17, 18. And for some reason, I don't know why, maybe just because I was maintaining a light, healthy body weight, I never really experienced the symptoms for a couple of years. Maybe stress levels were lower, I don't know why. But it seemed that when I was at the peak of my weight, that could be a contributing factor, being so heavy and unfit. The symptoms came back where I was experiencing those skipped beats and palpitations where my heart would race, even when I was lying in bed. Um, so that led me to just think, right, I don't think it's, I even believe to this day, it's not a correlation between that and the anabolics that I used because I've had everything checked out. My blood pressure's healthy, um, cholesterol's great, resting heart rate's great. Even the, there's no left ventricular hypertrophy, which is common amongst bodybuilders right. um, when you, you know, overwork, when you're very heavy and you're using those compounds. But um, 
when something like that happens to you, which I had when it was natural years ago, when it comes back with a vengeance, it makes you consider your health even more. So at that point, I took a step back from using anything and I haven't used anything since. So it's been just a little over a year. Um, and that coincided with shoulder injuries as well. So I was actually, did this two and a half years of putting all this weight on with the anticipation of going for my next competition and the, you know, the difference from the natural show at 21 to compared to the assisted show at 24 coming 25 yeah. would have been so dramatic. Would have been a crazy transformation. I never got to see that materialize because I just felt that if I'm having these issues and it's not necessarily the steroids were a contributing mm -hmm. factor, I just felt that it makes you take your health more seriously. And like we've discussed off camera, when you're on that pursuit, you kind of, oblivious to things or you're so preoccupied with that goal that you maybe overlook your health to a degree um, you know sitting breathing too heavy uh, you know <laughs> sleep apnea things like that that I had at the time that I've obviously been alleviated now with losing weight but your things that you kind of accept that are part of the process when you're bulking up to be a bodybuilder and when you step back from that and you realize now I'm fitter and lighter you think I don't really want to go back to that um, so, yeah, the palpitations that I've had, they've been like ongoing. They go away for a year, they, they get no symptoms for a year, and then they just came back with a vengeance. And at that time, I just felt like right now, I'm, I'm weighing this, I'm taking this, um, and I'm having these issues. I just think I want to dial it back, get back to being lighter and fitter. And um, it just makes you more conscious of your health, I think, when something like that happens to you, even if it's not related to what I was doing at the time. <sighs> Yeah. <laughs> it's um I mean like how close were you to competing then I was from I, like I we started the prep um oh, January ready right. to ready to compete well it was going to be a long prep because I was still very heavy probably had about 20 kilos to lose but when you're trying to gain that amount of muscle you kind of have to have some excess yeah. uh, to support that strength increase that you're trying to get and just to make sure that your body's in a surplus to grow not just maintain um but I was going to diet for about 20 weeks and then I had to cut it short. Shoulder injuries as well, tendonitis. I think I had a rotator cuff tear, which I'm still trying to recover from. I still have some clicking that I'm trying to overcome. But um, so that kind of compounding effect made me just stop the prep, which I'd actually worked two years towards actually putting the size on for, which was frustrating at the time. But and I'm a lot of glad. money in food. Yes, oh, absolutely. <laughs> Saying that, like, I've just started training back properly um, after this period where the shoulders not being the way they should. And I've got like a good amount of muscle memory and body's recomp quite well. So I guess in a sense, it has meant that that two years of really trying to grow means that actually maintaining a decent physique and a decent amount of muscle comes quite easily now because I've been a lot bigger than I am now, uh -huh. if that makes sense. So the muscle memory has at least come back, so. So have you not, did you, have you completely stopped training yeah, then since last year? I did, January? I did. Right. Um, so oh no, I, I still, I had, when the shoulder injury initially came about and the tendonitis, I, I couldn't even lift my arm. So I had about three months off, um, had a lot of like shockwave therapy with like injury, like clinics. Right. And um, rehabbed that, um, started getting into boxing. I was trying to put my, uh, I'd already done boxing in my teens anyway, but uh -huh. I was trying to like channel my energy that I couldn't into bodybuilding into something else. So I was doing right. the pads, going health for leather, injured the shoulder again. And then that led me to having like, for the best part of six months off training because it was just so much shoulder pain and frustrating trying to go to the gym and then having to leave halfway through the workout because I just couldn't do that exercise and this exercise. But I'm in a position now where I've really like improved my mobility. I'm starting to strengthen the areas I need to, like weak rotator cuffs. And I, I'm still not training at full capacity. There's still a lot of exercises in the gym that I can't do, um, particularly back exercises. But I feel like I'm getting back to that place and I'll hopefully get back to the kind of physique I want. Like, fairly yeah. soon. It, is it frustrating? Oh, very frustrating. When you've been doing it for like, you know, 10, 12 years, it's part of your identity, isn't it, really? Like, yeah. the gym and just not even necessarily looking a certain way, but just being in that environment and knowing that, well, it's kind of pointless for me going to the gym right now because I'm in so much pain with this shoulder. So you just sat at home kind of, it's a big part of your day. You don't realize until you're not going, although you're only in the gym for like two hours, it's such a huge part of your life. And everything around it, like your nutrition and recovery is accommodating that. And then when you're not training, all of those things tend to fall by the wayside because they're not the parts of the puzzle that you're not actually able to work towards. If that makes sense. I've only been off a couple of weeks with a bit of a right. leg injury, right. haven't been able to train my legs or do any of the conditioning stuff. And I'm pissed off. Yeah. Never yeah. mind all yeah. that. Yeah. That's a long time. I know. I'm trying not to like make it a sub story, but I'm past the point of like feeling sorry for myself. Now I just want to make sure that I get everything the way it should be so that I can just trade at full capacity. But there was a period where it was really frustrating. Yeah. yeah. I can't even imagine. Yeah. 
Like because I mean, what you said off camera, he's moved yeah. here yeah, to, to be trip. close to yes. the gym. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Bad. Yeah. Crazy. Um, I mean, I mean, how like with the actual show thing? Like, I mean, how is? Has that affected you anyway? Like, obviously, because I would say that, to an extent, yeah. Like, yeah. because the passion was to get to that. Yes, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of big exposure. pro stuff, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Especially if you're going from like the size that I was, I was still, although I did well in my competition, I was still like 21 and a lot smaller. And then the transformation would have been absurd, like the amount of muscle yeah. that had been gained in a couple of years, and I wasn't able to kind of demonstrate that, and that would have been inspiring to some people that were maybe at that size and wanted to go through that process. Um, or just competitors in general, there's a lot of exposure, especially if you feel that you're at the size where you can compete in a federation of higher calibre, you know, there's more yeah. exposure in that sense. So it would help the business to a degree and not being in the gym, not living the lifestyle to the extent I like to, um, definitely is, impacts you to a degree. And I just feel that as a coach, I always want to make sure that I'm walking the walk and showing my like clients that I'm, if they're doing it, I'm doing it. And you know, I would never ask something of them that I'm not doing myself. And that's always been the way, but when you're literally unable to train, yeah. it's kind of out with your control. And that was very frustrating, but I'm glad to be back kind of training in the capacity that's not hundred percent, but I'm still able to show I'm, I'm making changes and I'm in the gym so that they can at least feel like, well, my coach is doing what I'm doing. Yeah. So therefore they feel more invested. Whereas I didn't want to be that guy that was just sat at home not training yeah because that's not very motivating for the people that i'm trying to coach do you think it's made you a better coach yeah definitely and also even like mistakes that i look at like particularly the shoulder training shoulder exercises or chest exercises where i've been in my training overextending and now i'm very conscious of keeping everything retracted and right not, you know losing tension on certain muscles and um putting stress through the joint that i previously was even though my technique in the tra in training if you ask anybody i've trained with or even you watch my youtube videos yeah. i've always used very controlled eccentrics uh -huh. but it's these small little things you don't think about overextending and letting the joint be right. stacked that makes a difference and now when i like watch my clients videos i can identify that in them i tell them just make this slight adjustment shoulder blades back and down things I wish I'd known years ago. So that's definitely yeah, helped me massively in terms of training. And it's just a small thing, but it's definitely carried over into my feedback to my clients that's, on their training videos. Yeah. That's brilliant, that, because yeah, cause as much as you'd probably like all that exposure you've probably gained, you have gained. Yeah. Yes, um, yeah. Yeah, education about, in a way it's more, yeah like getting, doing the show would have been like more about me whereas actually me getting injured has brought more value to my coaching if that yeah. makes sense because and also I understand also like I've got clients like everybody I'm sure does that go through injuries and you can like sympathize with the situation they're in and you can talk from experience rather than me being somebody that's never been like just went through my training unscathed I wouldn't really be able to experience what they are. Whereas now, if a client has a shoulder injury or something, I can understand not only what they're going through physically, but mentally as well, the frustration yeah. of being able to do that. Fucking yeah. hell. Do you ever regret the PADs? Yes and no. Um, right. No, in the sense that I have competitive clients and you know, obviously everything is hypothetical with your clients, yeah. but um, advising them on what they could do for their competition. Um, has obviously allowed me to, and people are going to do it whether or not you coach them or not, or whether, you know, they're going to go to somebody else and they're going to use those compounds anyway. Yeah. Um, so at least anybody that's working with me, I know that they'll be doing it in the safest manner, strategically, and I can relay it back to what I did and what I found worked for me. Um, so that has helped in that sense. And also me being the size I was for that time period means that I am getting, I'm now finding myself getting bodybuilders who are actually of a bigger size. Whereas yeah. when I was smaller, it was only really, guys around my size that wanted to work with me, if that makes sense. Yes, because they've yeah. seen, I've been able to make that transition from that size to that size. They know this guy obviously knows how to build a physique at yeah. that rate um, and that degree of weight. Um, the yes, um, in the, like, I feel that myself, I could have, like when I look at pictures of when I was in the teens, I probably could have done very, very well in natural bodybuilding. Yeah. I'm certain I could have, and I, or even maybe in some of the federations in some capacity in the non-tested. Yeah. Um, because of just the way my physique looked at that age, and if I'd known what I know now, um, I would have been able to continually grow in from my, just my nutrition alone. But we can't uh, change the past. Yeah, of I have that, them thoughts in my head all the time, thinking it would have been better if I'd done that, but you know, you can't change the past. and. Um, it's led me to where I am now. Like yeah, you say, it's yeah. things I can, it benefits my coaching and benefits me going forwards, you know, not making those same mistakes. Yeah, but yeah, there's pros and cons. So what, um, 
I mean, normally, like, ended on, like, what piece of advice would you give to someone wanting to live a leaner, healthier lifestyle? Yeah. Should we stick with that? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. Because it was, it was going to be like a, a decision in going that way. Yeah. But I think, yeah. we'll go, well, no, we've talked about that enough. Yeah. So what, what one piece of advice would you, because uh, I think you're yeah, on the healthier. Quite a, few, quite a few pieces of advice, though. It'd be hard to give one. Yeah, because um, you're on the healthier train yes, now, trying yes, to live that definitely, healthier life. Definitely, so definitely. that healthier lane of life. Yeah, yeah. Um, just being conscious of what you're eating. Um, obviously, your exercise is crucial as well, like making sure that you're moving a lot. Like I obviously track my steps every day. That can go up and down based on uh, the current goal. Like for instance, I think 10,000 is a good amount to do each day just yeah. to like for digestion, uh, insulin sensitivity, and just health, especially if you're doing it on like a good terrain, like where I live is quite hilly. So right. that's active, that's kind of not cardio, but it is in a sense. Um, so I think just doing that, that if somebody was to, you know, do 5,000 steps a day for a year or 10,000 steps a day for a year, they would look very different at the end of that 12 month yeah. period. So I think making sure that you're holding yourself accountable to your activity levels, and then making sure that like whatever you do in the gym is something you enjoy making sure that you're not doing something because somebody else does it or somebody else has said that's the best way to do it, making sure that it's something that, yes, we can't always do things that we want to do. Like, I don't want to go to the gym and do a plank for five minutes every single morning, <laughs> but I'm trying to do that right now. Yeah. I don't want to go on the cross trainer every single morning for 25 minutes, but I'm doing that right now because it's right. going to give me the results that I want. So it's accepting that, like, we are sometimes going to have to do things that we don't want to do to have the result that we want, but equally... I think making sure that when you go into the gym, you are doing the exercises that you enjoy. For instance, I really enjoy doing an inclined dumbbell press. I wouldn't want to do a flat barbell bench press instead of that exercise. So I make sure that right. I do the exercises that I know are still gonna stimulate what I want to stimulate, but it's exercises that I really enjoy doing. So it's, you're not gonna turn up three, four, five days a week if it's not an exercise or a workout that you enjoy. So it's just making sure that what you do is something you really enjoy but equally accepting there are things that you're not necessarily going to want to do every yeah. day, but it's part of the process in order to get the result that you want, i.e. for that wedding or that holiday or that competition. Um, and then when it comes to food, just making good choices, you know, reading the back of the packages, um, not just from a caloric perspective, but like even the amount of ingredients. Like I try not to buy things that have like 50 ingredients. I try right, to yeah. eat whole, you know, foods, single ingredient foods and... Um, and also there's a, re there's a really good app that I use at the minute called Chronometer, which actually right. allows you to not only see your macronutrient breakdown, you, you know, obviously protein, carbs and fats, but you can actually see your vitamin C, your, your uh, iron level, which is zinc and stuff like that. So things just making sure that whatever you eat is actually providing you with the minerals and vitamins that you need. Um, so yeah, just like, depends what direction you want to go in. If you just want to get ready for a holiday um, or a photo shoot, you can have that like, 90 10 80 20 but understanding that if you're trying to win, like pursue competing it has to be 100 percent. so it's just making yeah. sure that your goal is your your actions reflect what your goal is so making sure that if you just want to trim up a bit then of course like there can be a little bit more of balance and a bit more sustainability but also if you want to do something extreme like competing you have to accept that you are going to have to say no to that night out that you know it might be your birthday it might fall during your cut and you kind of have to miss out on your cake that year yeah or at least have it at a later date things like that so it's understanding that if you're going to do a certain goal whether that be a photo shoot holiday competition prep that what you do day to day has to reflect that goal yeah so it's just making sure that everything relates to what you want to achieve and you're not having like unrealistic expectations of what you have to do every day yeah if that makes sense because right now um I'm not trying to get really, really ripped. So therefore I'm only doing 25 minutes of cardio, but I know if I was trying to get really, really ripped, that would have to go up to 40 minutes, 45, 60 minutes yeah. each day. And I'll probably have to do a lot more steps. So my food would have to go lower. So it's just understanding that um, your kind of actions have to be in accordance with what you want to achieve. Basically the bigger the goal, the bigger the sacrifice. Yeah, yeah exactly, 100%. Sweet. Yeah. So uh, where can we find you? <laughs> oh, Instagram right now, um, just Nikki Chesty, just my name. Yeah. Um, and on Facebook as well, but yeah, just those, that's all I really use. And I've got YouTube videos and I do hope to try and get back to doing that more consistently. Obviously, the last video I did was right at the end of that growing phase where yeah. I was, got injured there pretty soon after. I pulled Jenny on the yeah. same thing. I said, hers was yeah. a couple of months ago, yeah. yours was yeah. a year. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I need to get back on that bandwagon. Now I'm getting back in shape. I think it's more than justified, like me doing the videos again when I wasn't training and I wasn't really 
seen a need to go. Yeah. Um, but now that I'm back into a good routine with everything and also coming at it from a different perspective, I'm like lighter and fitter and I've been through that process. I can kind of discuss things differently and also show about the, I'd love to like demonstrate like the mistakes I was making when I thought I knew what I was doing and the kind of things I've learned now in order to prevent those injuries right. reoccurring. So yeah, I definitely want to get back on YouTube as well, which I'll just like put on my Instagram when that comes around. Perfect. Thank yeah. you very much, Thank buddy. You. Cheers, Cheers bud. Appreciate it.